Today we'll be going over the startup and maintenance procedures for a PCP3000S 338WP air-cooled closed-loop chiller which is typically cooling an MRI. Here are some of the basic tools you'll need to complete the startup procedure on the filtering chiller. You'll need a voltmeter with an amp clamp. You'll need diagonal cutters, uh, various refrigeration wrenches for the service valves. You'll need an adjustable wrench, crescent wrench, uh, Phillips screwdriver, slotted screwdriver, 7 16 nut driver to remove the bottom panels from the chiller, and a 6 millimeter T wrench or an Allen wrench um, if you need to change the wiring on the three phase connections. And you may find it useful to have a flashlight as well. When the unit is placed on the site, uncrated, you want to make sure that the unit is properly placed so that there is adequate clearance for service and ventilation around all sides of the unit. On the service side of the chiller, uh, the side where our electrical connections and our plumbing connections, you want to ensure that there's a minimum of 36 inches of clearance for service and on the other remaining sides of the chiller, you want to make sure that there is a minimum of 24 inches of clearance. On the back of the chiller, this is the air intake side of the chiller. Um, here you also want to remember to make sure that there is at least 24 inches of clearance uh, between the chiller and any other obstruction. Uh, you also want to make sure that when the chiller is placed that there aren't any electrical equipment or HVAC equipment of any kind which could be exhausting hot air into the airflow sucking into the condenser of the chiller. All of this information as far as clearances and all the other information that you'll need to do the installation will be found in the manual which we'll access now. In order to access the inside of the chiller um, and gain the access to the manual you'll remove the panels Remove, start by removing the top panels by placing your fingers in these grommets here. Lift up, pull out, and then the, then the cover will slide down. And just set that aside. Once you have the top panels uh, removed and safely set aside, then you can remove the bottom panels. And you do that by using a 7 16 nut driver there are either two, one or two bolts in each of the bottom panels and you just unscrew these Once you have all the panels that you need to remove from the chiller removed, um, you can go ahead and locate your manual, which will be in a folder that looks like this. It'll be secured to the uh, piping with a wire tie, which you can clip off with your diagonal cutters. This manual will contain all the information that you need, all the technical specifications, um, and all the information that you need for the startup as well as a set of prints, electrical diagrams, will all be in the back of the manual. To review the main components inside the chiller cabinet, you have your electrical box, panel, and connections, including plumbing connections at this end. The recirculating pump, the condenser, the compressor, the oil separator, the liquid line dryer, receiver, and finally the immersion coil evaporator and tank. This particular chiller has two tanks, each of which has its own coil. All filtering tanks are stainless steel with stainless steel coils. They are insulated and covered with an outer metal jacket to hold the insulation in place. When first opening the cabinet, it is a good idea to inspect all of the major components and piping for signs of movement or damage during shipping. All of the refrigerant will be pumped down in the receiver for shipment. 
This is done at the factory as a precaution to prevent the catastrophic loss of refrigerant during shipment. On the left end of the unit, where the connections and electrical box are located, you'll find a tag inside the electrical box reminding you that the pump plug has been removed for shipment. You must locate this plug and reinstall it before filling the unit. So using a 9 16 or your adjustable wrench, you'll install the pump plug into the pump housing. And you'll just want to make sure that it's good and tight so that we won't have any leaks. And the pump plug is always located at the bottom of the pump. And there it's installed. Next to the control panel on this end of the chiller, we have your connections for your plumbing, your field install wiring, you have your gauges for your temperature and pressure, and also your refrigeration gauges up here. You have your sight glass and your air vents right here. Uh, before you begin filling the chiller, you want to open these about a quarter of a turn. That will release any air that's in the system as it's being filled. And then you want to open your water supply and begin filling the chiller. And when you get water coming from the from the air vents, it'll have some air coming out as well. You want to make sure that all the air gets out. And then you can close these. And turn off your water supply. The primary components in the electrical box are the terminal strip, which connects and routes all of the signal wires, the contactors, the thermostat, which establishes the set point and unloading temperature for the unit, the breakers. The top breaker is exclusively used for the compressor, while breakers 1 through 4 are for the three fans and the pump. The phase monitor that protects the unit from improper phasing. The LED on the phase monitor should be green. If the LED is red, then two of the legs will need to be reversed. Finally, the refrigerant fuse. This is a small glass fuse used for the compressor. The cage is orange, so it can easily be identified. On the back side of the electrical box door, each unit will also have a unit tag. This tag will identify the serial number and model number of the unit along with performance and technical information on the chiller. A copy of this tag can also be found in the manual. This chiller is supplied with a single point electrical connection for you to bring your power in. We also have a knockout for any remote connections, alarms, or connecting the unit to a building management system. The field wiring for your incoming voltage to the chiller will be through the panel will be connected here on the L1, L2, L3 terminals for the three phase wiring. Uh, what we're going to do is turn the power on to the chiller, make sure that the phase is correct by using the phase monitor. Okay, as you can see, our phase is incorrect. We have a red LED indicator on the phase monitor. So what we're going to do is shut the power off and you're gonna reverse two of the three legs and then retest the phase monitor. Okay, so as you can see, we now have green LED indicator and two amber LED indicators. And this is the correct configuration. Now we know that the phase is correct. Once you've ensured that the phase is correct, then you want to check your line voltage from leg to leg. 
and make sure that you're getting proper voltage to each leg. In all three phases. What you want to do is to check the rotation of the pump to ensure the impeller is rotating in the right direction and the pump is wired correctly. In order to check the rotation of the pump, you'll need to use a flashlight to be able to see in the housing of the motor. Make sure that the circuit breaker to the pump is turned on and then just bump the contactor manually to check for rotation and it should be a clockwise rotation. Now we want to open up all the refrigeration valves in the system. I want to remove all the caps and going to open up these valves and backseat them all the way. And this will release all the refrigerant from the receiver, which is how it's shipped into the system. There are a total of six refrigeration valves that will need to be located, opened, and backseated on this chiller model. The valves are located on both the high and low side of the compressor, either side of the oil separator, and two on the receiver. So the last thing you want to do when you open up these valves is make sure that you tighten the packing nut on the valves to ensure that you don't have any refrigeration leaks there as well. At this point, you want to verify that your set point thermostat is set to its proper setting. I believe in this case, 46.4 degrees. Next, we want to ensure that the breakers are all turned on. These breakers have been factory set for their proper settings at the factory. You just need to turn them on, make sure they're in the right position, as well as the compressor breaker. Once those are all on, then we can start our pump. Okay, at this point, we can start the pump by switching the control switch to manual. And verify that you have a green indicator for pump run and that you have no red indicators. You'll be able to see your discharge pressure and temperature on these gauges here. At this time, you can remove the fuse for the compressor. And install it into the fuse holder. The pump is designed to run continuously, and you'll just want to make sure that in the field you set up your your uh, flow rate and your pressure uh, for what it's supposed to be set to. In this case, 35 gallons a minute at 65 PSI. Once the entire unit is up and running, you will want to check the amperages on each of the chiller components and make sure that they are operating within the acceptable range indicated on the chiller tag or in the manual. To do this, use your amp probe to read the amp draw on each individual lead and compare the reading to the tag on the back of the electrical box door. This chiller is designed to detect three alarm conditions, which are indicated on the alarm light panel next to the manual on-off switch. These alarms are the low temp cutout, which indicates the liquid being cooled has fallen below the preset set point on the low temp thermostat. This alarm protects the chiller from freeze up that can damage chiller components. Oil pressure failure and thermal overload which both indicate a failure with the compressor and alert the owner that compressor service is required. In order to test the low temp cutout alarm, you will need to access the low temp cutout thermostat on the back side of the unit in the lower compartment. Using a slotted screwdriver, raise the set point on the thermostat until it reaches the current temperature of the liquid being cooled and make sure that the unit shuts off. As you can see, now the red alarm light has been illuminated indicating the low temp cutout alarm has been tripped and is functioning properly. Return the set point of the low temp cutout thermostat to its original setting and restart the unit. All the alarm lights should now be off and the chiller should be running normally.
Okay, now that the chiller has been tested and is fully operational, we want to go through before we put the panels back on, make sure that you have uh, fully backseated all of the service valves, including the service valves that we left partially open um, for the gauges on the compressor. Go ahead and fully backseat those at this time. Also make sure that you pick up any tools that you may have left or rags or any, any items inside the chiller. Okay, now we'll go ahead and reinstall all of our panels, starting with the bottom, bottom panels first. And you just reinstall the panels in the same order or the reverse order from where you took them off. Okay, now that we have everything all closed up, this concludes the startup procedure for the filtering chiller. If you have any questions or concerns, uh, please feel free to contact the factory or your local rep, and they'll be happy to help you out. Thank you for watching.